Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and we're still, as you can see here, we're still in the midst of our little pullback that we've been going through. And a lot of times when these things happen, I, I, tr I like to give you some perspective. Like, like here, if you look like XRP, for instance, last seven days minus 24%. This is called perspective, folks. Um, here's your last seven days and you'll see XRP 24%. A lot of, we see a lot of red, but this is perspective folks i want you to look at these numbers you don't see these kind of numbers in in the stock market and you see them in crypto like it's no big deal and so my point is is that to experience this you have to experience short time spans like this um, and i don't think it's a bad trade-off personally um, so i just wanted to make that that point now uphold put this out we talked about venmo this morning they said Venmo adds crypto app. Venmo now has a button that will let users buy as little um, as a dollar worth of Bitcoin and several other digital assets and send it to friends. And so now you're going to be able to send crypto to friends as payment is what that looks like to me. Okay, crypto bull. After XRP moved from 56 cents to $1.96 within 10 days, this is a perfect and healthy corrective pattern. When the bull flag breaks, we will move to break $2. So this guy's saying break $2. Um, who was it? Credible Crypto was was saying that the uh, next, excuse me, the next break could could send us past um, could send us past the all time high. That's what I'm hoping for. Okay, and then there was this from XR Patients. XRP ODL remittances from USD to Philippine are the PHP are through the roof right now. And he's got a um, picture of, of this. And so ODL is accelerating. I wanted to show you this, the Crypto D sent me this. Remember Tony Valentino, who was one of the people that disappear, disappeared from social media and said a lot of things that sounded pretty intriguing, almost as if he might know something. It says regulatory clarity will be the first major announcement this will open the gates to many institutions that are waiting on the sidelines. We could easily see the market cap grow. He's talking about XRP. We could easily see the market cap grow by a few trillion within weeks. Next step will be UN, IMF, Fed throwing their weight behind XRP. All right. Pay attention. All right. Now, I tweeted this yesterday. I was asking tax questions about Flair. A lot of people copied Flair and Hugo Filion, I think is how you say his last name, from, he's the CEO of Flair. I think this is a, an issue worth keeping out there. I think that this is something that needs to be talked about. I put this hypothetical out there just because I'm trying to go through this in my mind and see how this could pan out. Um, I said, hypothetically, you receive your second, the second drop of your spark, okay? Let's say it was 50,000 spark. The price at that time is $1. And so my understanding would be that I would then have to pay um, $50,000. That would be considered $50,000 in ordinary income. So a sale of, and then that would, I'm saying that could, could trigger a sale of spark because people need to cover those taxes. Because when you receive it, you now have to pay ordinary income. And a lot. I'm, what I'm worried about is that a lot of people will sell because they have to. If they don't hurry up and sell some of it, then they won't be able to cover those taxes that they have now incurred. That's, that's a concern I have. That's really the, at the core of this, which is why I wanted to see if somebody out there might be able to answer these issues. And then the, the crazy part is, on top of that ordinary income, once you sell it, then you also have capital gains. So you have, an, you have to pay ordinary income taxes and capital gains taxes on the same thing right there, just like that. So I, I, I'm wanting to find out some answers to this. And that's the question that my father, the, the official father of the Digital Asset Investor channel had brought up. Okay, Chinu Patel sent me this. 
from Brian Brooks. We, we mentioned this morning that he, he has now become the CEO of Binance.us. Excited to join Binance.us as CEO and to launch my new handle, Brian Brooks US. Stay tuned for big things. I wanted to mention while we're here, um, I don't know if I've ever, I think I've mentioned it before. I use Binance.us. Let me see if they show any of the stuff they have. I use Binance.us to trade in some of the things that like Coinbase does not have. So for instance, you can buy Solana. I've bought Solana on Binance. They've got a really user-friendly platform too. You can also, I've bought Hedera Hashgraph on Binance.us. I think maybe VeChain um, and a couple of others that I can't think of off the top of my head. But I put a link in the, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video. If you want to go sign up for a Binance.us account, the link will be there. All right, moving along. Okay, this is interesting. Mr. Whale, Crypto Whale, Bitcoin is faltering since around since around 48% of the Bitcoin network went offline after a single Chinese mining rig exploded. We've seen major consequences. Hash rate has crashed. Difficulty has surged and the transaction fees just hit new record of $58. The price will follow shortly. Now, that is, is interesting. Now look down here. He says the last time we saw a surge in transaction fees and unconfirmed transactions was during the late stages of the last Bitcoin bubble. Anyone transacting Bitcoin will now spend 9,000% more in fees than any bank and wait on average 4,600% longer. The future of finance. And he's laughing. This is what I've been telling you folks. All right. Crypto Dim sent me a video from, from Jim Rogers and I clipped out this section of it. I want to remind you all who Jim Rogers is. Jim Rogers founded the Quantum Fund with George Soros. It is known that the Rothschild family and other wealthy Europeans put $6 million into the fund in 1973. Pay attention to what these people say, not dummies, and read this. And my point is, is that these guys are the masters of the game, folks. Breaking the Bank of England, a possible sequel. The quantum fund is the fund that uh, that shorted the uh, was it the sterling, and then Jim Rogers and and these guys are notorious for going on and talking. Like here, it says Jim Rogers, the former business partner of George Soros, says sterling is a basket case, sagging under the weight of a depressed UK economy. In other words, these guys they go out and they and they bash things like the sterling, and and there's nothing wrong with them doing it. They're they're just giving their opinion on things, but it, it can end up crashing things. Okay, but the things Jim Rogers says in this clip are true. Listen to him. Yes, if it becomes successful, Michelle, as long as it's a trading vehicle, and I know guys are making lots of money trading Talking about it. Bitcoin. It's a wonderful trading vehicle, apparently. But if it becomes a currency, which is what the crypto people say they are and they will be i cannot imagine that any government or many governments in the world will say okay you can use our money or their money that's not what history shows we think of them more as crypto assets because crypto what people call cryptocurrencies they're really vehicles for speculation no one is using them for payments for example like the dollar what they're using them for is to speculate it's like it's a little bit like gold for, you know, for thousands of years, human beings have, have given gold this special value that it doesn't have from an industrial standpoint, but nonetheless, for thousands of years, they've done that. So Bitcoin is much more like that, and the cryptocurrencies are much more like that. They're not, they're not really being uh, actively used as payments. Do you agree with that? Is it like gold? Well, it's or certainly is that just an offense to your sensibilities to put Bitcoin and gold in the same camp? No, of course not. Uh, anything that the world wants to use is fine with me. Uh, but he said the same thing I do. The people are using it as trading vehicles, which is exactly what it is so far. Uh, if it becomes a currency, then something else will change. No, there's no question that what he said about it. it's like, I mean, you cannot go down to the shop and buy bread with gold right now. You cannot go down to the shop and buy bread with Bitcoin either right now. But history would indicate that silver and gold probably have a better future because they're not trying to compete with the dollar or the yen or something else. 
something like that. Okay. Sorry, I was sitting here texting someone. Um, all right, now I wanted to go on to this. Now, Jeremy Hogan has given a, an SEC update. The first thing that I wanted to show you that he talks about here, he's talking about the, um, the uh, this was what happened last week where the SEC was trying to, um, with contacts over in Europe, turn some of Ripple's customers against them or, or, or mess with them, I guess. Listen to this should be ordered to seize all use of MOU requests, close quote. And this is what is going on. The United States government has agreements called Memorandum of Understanding MOUs with other countries where essentially they can make requests of each other. So, for example, the SEC can go to the Japanese security agency and say, please ask SBI Corp for all documents related to the XRP security. And the Japanese security agency would say, wait, XRP is not a security. Donde monai, baka. Just a little joke there. So under the MOU, the Japanese security agency, which is called the Kinyucho, would respond by making the request to the SBI company. And then the SBI company would, of course, have to respond to their government agency with all of the documents that are related to XRP. And then the Japanese government would forward all those documents to the SEC. And all of this is done under a kind of a treaty agreement between the US and Japan. Now, not only is what the SEC doing outside the scope of the federal rules of civil procedure, but it's also outside of the court order issued by the judge regarding discovery in this case. And it also puts a burden and stress on Ripple's business partners getting all these uh, requests from the, their government agencies. So Ripple and the other defendants have objected to the court in this letter, and I have reviewed the case authority in brief, and unless the SEC pulls a surprise out of somewhere, I think the SEC is in for another bad ruling against it because this just, it really isn't fair. Uh, us lawyers would say equitable. You can't use the full the power and authority of the U.S. government in civil litigation against a private entity. No private party could go to Japan and force them to give them certain documents. And I don't understand why the SEC is doing this. And if I was the judge, I would be a little irritated that the SEC was making an, an end run around the rules of the court. So I don't understand what they are doing. And I think they, were gonna, they are going to get hammered for it. And I could be wrong. But so far in this litigation, I'm batting about 900. So if I was a baseball player, Everyone except the Yankees would hire me. Little. Okay. Um, now, uh, this this next part I wanted to show you is where he's talking about um, John Deaton's motion, and this is interesting too. Quote: The complaint filed by the SEC is a bewildering attempt to regulate XRP itself as a security, rather than limit the allegations to defendants' specific sales and distributions of investment contracts. The SEC repeatedly claims XRP to be a security per se. And he is correct. It's not XRP itself, which is just an alphanumeric sequence, really, which is a security. It's the sale or sales that must be analyzed of XRP. And Deaton hits them with this on page two in the quote from the Telegram case, quote, the security was not the gram itself, not the cryptocurrency itself, but the entire scheme that comprised the purchase and undertakings by Telegram, close quote. Now, I love the reference to the Telegram case because the SEC's attorney in the Telegram case was the same as in the Ripple case. So that maybe be a little jab in there. And again, the SEC has only itself to blame for being in the position to have to try and make the argument that XRP is somehow a security in and of itself because it waited so long to file the litigation. In the Telegram case, the sales of the Gram coin took place in 2018, and the lawsuit was filed in 2019 after only one sale, making it a very clean case for the SEC. With Ripple, there have been, I don't even know how many sales, ever since 2013 hundreds. So if the SEC doesn't allege a kind of per se security status, are they going to go in and gather facts about each and every sale and argue the facts over a hundred different sales? No, that would be an absolute mess. So the SEC is with is left really with this general vague argument about XRP being a security per se. So that is the proposed answer to the lawsuit, and it is fairly straightforward. I think the judge will see how the XRP holders will kind of fit into this litigation. But before that happens, Attorney Deaton and the XRP holders have to persuade the judge that they should be allowed into the lawsuit, and that is what the motion to intervene is for. So let's take a quick look at that under the federal rules in order to get involved. Okay, I'm not going to go any further into this, but I, th I thought that was a pretty good summary of what's going on. Then John Deaton had tweeted this, that um, SEC and Ripple have until May 3rd to respond. Ripple could elect not to. 
May 17th is the deadline for me to reply to the SEC response. I've requested an oral argument, and if granted, it would likely be during the week of May 24th. So that's some dates. Um, then TD Ameritrade had tweeted this out. Cryptocurrencies could potentially be considered a viable alternative investment for portfolio diversification. You should have contacted me two plus years ago, TD Ameritrade, and I would have made you aware of this. You could have gone ahead and tweeted it out two or three years ago. All you had to do was call. Free American Spirit, Wall Street uh, banks brace for digital dollars as the next big disruptive force. I want you to read, I want you to see this part down here. Digital Money 2.0, as the Fed and other central banks work through those logis logistical issues, Wall Street is growing in anticipation over what the future will hold. The race towards Digital Money 2.0 is on. Citigroup said in a, in a report, some have framed it as the new space race or digital currency cold war. In our view, it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. There's a lot of room for the overall digital pie to grow. Um, there, however, has been at least a semblance of a race, and China is perceived as taking the early lead. Um, and I do stress the word perceived because I've never believed that. Um, okay, James Rule put this out. It's an interesting article that's good for, for you to, um, to pay attention to. Four ways to say, stay safe in crypto. The first, I'll go down here, be aware of the most common crypto scams. There's a lot of them. And then the second he's got that, that's in this article is never make a digital copy, copy for your, of your personal crypto details. Just always write it down. Always enable two-factor authentication when possible. And the final is use a different password for every crypto platform you use. I want to go back up to this one because you can make this even a bigger thing. Always enable two-factor authentication when possible. Two-factor authentication is that thing where you download like Google Authenticator, the app on your phone, or you get them to text you a code every time you log in. Well, there's a, the safe, there's a safer way than both of those, and that's what I use. Um, it's getting one of these, uh, something like a Yubi key. These are, these are um, security keys. And the way it works is you'll have a username and a password, say like on Coinbase, and then when you type those in and you hit enter, then it will prompt you, it will ask you for your security key. It can be Yubi key or another one. Um, and then unless you have that physical key, nobody is getting into your account. This is institutional grade security. This is what I use. You, I recommend it for, they're like 50 bucks. I'm gonna put a, a link in the description of this video at the very top for this, because you, you need to, I'm telling you, this is the way to protect yourself. If you're gonna have anything on um, any of these exchanges, a Coinbase or a whatever, anyway. And it doesn't just protect your, your accounts like that. It can also protect your Google account, your Twitter account, all, a lot of different accounts, your email account. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that they need a security key for their two-factor authentication. It's the smartest way. It's institutional-grade security. Do it. Thank you for listening.